Glory to God. I want to welcome you to another one of our lessons on applied righteousness. I'm Pastor Stewart, and we're going to get right into our lesson. We're going to open in prayer. Father, I thank you for opening for me a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Letting your children know, Father, that you love them and the lengths that you have gone to, to ensure that no one can ever take them out of your hand, out of the hand of our Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for this salvation. We thank you for this information that you're going to impart to us now as we study your word. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Well, we've been studying here recently the fact that uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to start off there again in the first verse, and the reason we're going over this, I actually want to belabor this. I want us to take the time to think about this. I want us to take this and, and, and just meditate on it to where it gets to the point that we know for sure that that's not only what the scripture says, but that's exactly what the scripture means so that we have an understanding the Word of God says more than once that he would not have us to be ignorant. And this one thing that I'm fully assured of, that he would not have us to be ignorant of the fact that we have been made righteous. And that's why we're studying applied righteous. Now that we've come to this conclusion that the Word says what it means and means what it said when it said that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and it also says that Jesus has been made righteousness unto us, that, that those statements, those scriptures are true. Now we're looking at how are we going to apply this to our lives? Is it going to change the way we think? Is it going to change the way we walk? Is it going to change the way we speak? so that our walk will line up with the Word of God, our speech will line up with the Word of God, our thinking will line up with the Word of God. We're in the process of renewing our minds. And it said that if we would renew our minds, over in Romans 12, it says if we would renew our minds, we would prove for ourselves what's God's perfect and acceptable will for our lives. We'll no longer have to search and wonder, God, what's my purpose? What, 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 what am I here for? What, what's this all about? You will know, even as you students know that you've been called to minister God's word, you'll be able to impart through your ministry the knowledge that others have been called according to the word of God. And so let's start our our lesson off this morning back in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Tell you what we'll do. We'll read this from the Amplified Bible. It says, For since the law has merely a rude outline, foreshadowing of good things to come, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. Now, if you remember when we were studying and going through chapter 9, we saw that the earthly tabernacle that the high priest ministered in were only a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. So this, is, this, this was only a shadow of the real. It wasn't the real thing. And it's saying that those sacrifices that were offered year by year, those sacrifices that were offered by the priests did not have the ability to make a person mature in the things of God. Or perfect, it uses the word perfect, in the things of God. They were always conscious of themselves and of their sin rather than being conscious of their Lord and their God. The law kept them sin conscious. Now, God did what he did to remove the sin consciousness from the minds of the people. He did what he did in Christ Jesus because 
the sacrifices they were offering could never clear the person's conscience. They were always conscious of the fact that they were in need of a savior, that they were sinners. They needed sacrifices year after year. They actually had sacrifices every day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. They had blood sacrifices. This was all because of sin. Sin came into the world. And that sin could not be removed by the blood of a bull or a goat. Or in a tabernacle, the, the people could not come into the tabernacle. If in the tabernacle, they had a holy place and they, they had a holy of holy places where the Spirit of God would meet with the high priest and the high priest he had sprinkled blood on himself and then sprinkled blood on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of the sins of the people but the people themselves were restricted from going into the presence of God and God in Christ Jesus was making a way so that the people didn't have to go through the high priest they could go directly with God. They could have a relationship with God. And so as we read here in the, in the, I'll read the first verse again. For since the law was merely a rude outline foreshadowing of the good things to come, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifice, sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. Verse 2, for if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? For if it was otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? There's that question mark again. Same in the Amplified Bible as it is in the King James. If you answer the question, if you think about it at all, why would they continue to have the sacrifices if one sacrifice would have made them perfect? It would have removed all sin consciousness from them. It would have sufficed forever. Why would they continue to have sacrifices year after year? Well, they wouldn't have. That's really the answer, and the scripture answers it. It says, since the worshiper had once for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. So, <clears throat> so now this is where we come in and we start thinking, if the sacrifice had been perfect, so now we have to ask ourselves the question, was Jesus the perfect sacrifice? And if, according to these scriptures, if Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, it says it would have cleansed us once for all. All what? All time, all sin, once forever. We would have been cleansed. There was no need for Jesus to come back again year after year. There's no need for Jesus to come back. And if, when we give this some thought, <coughs> excuse me, if the sacrifice of Jesus did not remove sin, then him coming back to do it again would have been no more effective than it was the first time. So what, what, what we, were, we, were, we were in a position that if the sacrifice of Jesus didn't work and it had to be done over and over again, we would have been in the same position that the children of Israel were in under the Mosaic Covenant. But the sacrifice of Jesus was one time and once for all, for all time, for all men, for all sin, all sin. This sacrifice is so awesome and it differs so much from what happened. I, I was just recently reminded that the fact that the sacrifice of Jesus differed in so many ways from the sacrifice of a bull or a goat. You know, the sacrifice of Jesus was a voluntary sacrifice. The bulls and the goats didn't volunteer. <laughs> they didn't. They were just slaughtered. It wasn't something they were doing voluntarily. Jesus laid down his life for us. 
He said, no man takes my life. He said, my father has given me the power to lay it down and to pick it up again. And he trusted his father. And we saw over in, earlier, we were looking in uh, First Peter. Let's turn there. The reason Jesus did this voluntary sacrifice is in 1 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll start reading in verse 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it says, For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now this is why we came over. This is why Jesus did what he did. He said, Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God. So Jesus did everything that he did, not so that we would trust him, but so that we would trust his heavenly father, the way he trusts his heavenly father. And it's great reward in this, because the scriptures say without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you don't have faith that God is going to do what he said he was going to do, that he has not done what he said he has done, you couldn't have the faith of Jesus. But Jesus said, I did this so you would have as much faith in the Father as I have. The Father gave me a promise. He said, if I lay my life down, I'll be able to pick it up again. What if his Father hadn't been truthful? He'd have laid his life down instead of a three-way split. We now have what? Two-way split. God the Father, God the Holy Ghost. Jesus is out of the picture. But Jesus said, I can trust my Father. It's so important for us because when we can grow, or as we grow in faith and in trust in our Heavenly Father, we can do what Jesus said we could do. He said, you'll do the things that I do. The works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these, he said, because I'm going to go to the Father. The Father's going to send the Holy Spirit According to the scriptures, it was the Holy Spirit in the heavenly holy of holies that presented the blood of Jesus on the heavenly mercy seat. And it said that when Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, when they asked Jesus uh, what works were they to do to do the work of God, Jesus said, the work you're called to do is to believe the, on the one whom the Father has sent. He said, you believe me, you believe my word. And if we can, as we grow to that level, we'll do the works that Jesus did. And they asked Jesus, how do you do these things? How, how do you raise the dead? How do you heal the sick? How do you heal the maim? How do you do these things? He told us really plainly. And this is where he wants us as his children to grow to, where we're doing the works of Jesus. We're healing the sick, we're raising the dead, we're healing the lame. He wants us to grow to that point, and he explained to us how he did it. He said, I speak the words, my father does the work. He had so much trust in his father that he displayed the ultimate trust in laying his life down, believing the father, had given him the ability to pick it up again. And he said, I've got, I've got ultimate trust in the Father. He says, now I'm doing this to show you that you can have ultimate trust in the Father. So that when you grow into the knowledge of this, that you can come to the place where you're willing to go and speak the words, believing that your Heavenly Father will do the works. You'll get it off of you where you're not thinking, well, they would get up and the legs would grow back or the arms would grow back or the dead would be raised. 
because I, 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 uh, I haven't committed any sins. He wants us past that, to where we're not thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about the one with no arms or no legs, or the one that has died an untimely death. And we're speaking those words to bless others. Our thinking is on the others, not on ourselves. We've gotten out of ourselves. We actually want these people to be raised up. We want them to be healed. And we're willing to go forward just like Jesus did when he went to the tomb of Lazarus. He said, Father, I know you always hear me. He said, but I'm praying for the sake of these people that are here. He was praying so they would know that he was going to the Father. He wasn't taking glory for himself. And then he called Lazarus forth and what happened? Lazarus came hopping out. Well, I don't know if he hopped. <laughs> he is still wrapped in grave clothes. I don't know how he walked. <laughs> so anyway, this is what all of this is about in Hebrews. It's trying to get us to stop being conscious of sin. Sin has been done away with. The S-I-N, sin. The noun, sin, has been destroyed. When it says it's remitted, I, I just heard this morning someone used a, a phrase, and it's someone that I love to listen to them teach, and they used a phrase which has become common in the church, and it's not scripturally accurate. I understand what the person meant when they said it, and they used the term referring to the blood of Jesus, saying, well, that's under the blood. Well, things are not put under the blood of Jesus. Things were put under the blood of bulls and goats, and that's what the scripture in Hebrews is talking about. The blood of the bull and the goats covered their sin for a year, but it couldn't do away with the sin. So for us to think that our sins are under the blood of Jesus, that means that, it, that you could take away the blood of Jesus and the sins would still be there. That's not the case. The blood of Jesus completely and totally destroyed not only all sin, but all sins. That's why we can say we're forgiven. Our future sins have already been forgiven because sin itself has been done away with. The scriptures tell us that Jesus died for the sin of the world. For the sin, that's saying Jesus died for the sin of mankind. He did not die for the sin of believers. Well, let me put it this way. It's not limited to the sins of believers. He died for the sin of the world, the sin of mankind. Every man now is free of sin there is no penalty against man for sin between man and God. Now that's a very mature position to get to because we in our pride want to think that we have something to do with this. I thank my God I don't have anything to do with this. That God set it up so that it was all done in and through Christ Jesus. It's not based on me. It's not based on my actions, it's all based on his actions. And so now I can come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm not like the Old Testament saints where the high priest, Jesus is our high priest, but he opened the way for us to come into the Holy of Holies, for us to come into the presence of God. The Old Testament saints could not come into the presence of God. There was a veil, there was a partition. Well, there's still a veil. And that veil is through the flesh of Jesus. And you go into the Holy of Holies, you're covered in the blood of Jesus. You're not covered in sin. This is what all of this is about. And it was being explained, I think, really well in the book of Hebrews. I think God put this so plain that no one can misunderstand it. If they are to read it and they're to study it. And they're to see what God did in and through Christ Jesus. The lengths that God went to 
to bring mankind into a position of righteousness. Now the challenge is whether or not man will accept the gift of righteousness. It's a gift. It's a gift. Turn to Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Romans chapter 8. And we'll look at verse number Romans chapter 8. And we'll see here. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 17. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. It says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that's speaking about the sin of Adam. He cast all mankind in the spiritual death through that one sin of disobedience. Jesus redeemed all mankind by one act of obedience. He reversed what Adam did. And this is what this is talking about. So it's for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I want to read that in the Amplified Bible too. It says, For if because of one man's trespass, lapse offense, death reign through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness putting them in right standing with himself, reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Read the 18th verse. It says, well, well then, as one man's trespass, one man's false step in falling away led to condemnation, for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and right standing with God and life for all men. Is that plain? It's really plain. It said Adam messed up and Jesus corrected Adam's mistake. They cast us all into condemnation. Now here we have received the free gift of righteousness, but it's something about the a gift, it must be received. You come bearing gifts to me, I don't have to accept your gifts. And that's where mankind is now, and the message that we're called to go out and herald is that Jesus has reversed what Adam did. And by receiving the sacrifice of Jesus, receiving the gift of righteousness, receiving it by grace, it says the, the, the grace, the abundance of grace, and the free gift of righteousness, we're put back in right standing with our Heavenly Father. And we were designed, all of this is so important because man was to, designed, created, and given the charge to reign and rule on this earth. And that's what this scripture does says. Jesus has brought us back to a place where we're to reign and rule over the earth. He goes on over in the 8th chapter of Romans, and it says the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the children to grow up, take their authority, and rule and reign this whole creation. And we're to do it from a position of rest. 
that this seems deep and it's not deep it's just not taught a lot we've been made a kingdom of kings and priests the scriptures tell us that we didn't make ourselves we have been made God did all of this a king rules from a position uh, uh, where he's seated and he issues commands with his voice and this is what is telling us that if we will take our rightful position and re of rest and then we shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto us. The scriptures are telling us how we're to rule and to reign as kings but as long as we have this consciousness of sin we're going to be thinking inwardly instead of thinking of what God has done in the place that he's brought us to. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. We'll just follow the Holy Spirit through this. Go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. We'll read this in the King James and in the Amplified Bible. Now follow this. We're not leaving where we started. We're no longer to be sin conscious. We're to be righteousness conscious because we've been received a gift of righteousness and through this gift, the awesome power of this gift, we're to rule and reign as kings over the whole creation. God's original purpose man. And in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Well you need to go back and read chapters 3 and 4 and see why this starts off with be ye therefore. Therefore what? Based on what has been said before. But we're not going to do that right now. You can do that in the time you have to study. But I want to point out, we'll read it in the Amplified Bible, and you'll see why we came over here. It says, therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. If you are going to copy your heavenly father, just like kids, you know, in fact, I had uh, uh, just yesterday evening, I had... Uh, a granddaughter that I have some cowboy boots and she came clomping in the room with my cowboy boots on. Now they're almost as tall as she is. And she said, how do you walk in these, Grandpa? She said, they're so heavy. Well, they are heavy and for a kid I would imagine they're really heavy. And it takes some practice just trying to stand up in them. But she was imitating me. This is what the Word of God is telling us, imitate our Heavenly Father. Now, how are we going to imitate God? If we had a play, you're going to write a play and you are going to write a, a, a script for someone to, to, to imitate God. What would the lines be that you would give them? What, what would be the actions that you would tell them? So I want you to imitate God. What would you tell them to do? You think about that? What would you have them do? What would they do to imitate God? To follow God would be to follow his example and his example was the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. So if we want to do what God does, we'd look to the Lord. We'd look to our Lord Jesus. What did he do? He healed the sick. He opened 
the blind eyes, he loosed the, 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 the tongues, the dumb tongues, he, he, he healed the maim, he raised the dead. He did what he saw his father do. How did he see his father raise the dead? He raised him. <laughs> he saw this. And see, he saw all of this before it happened. We see it all after it happened. We weren't there. We see it in the Word of God. That's where his son saw it. If his father said, I'll raise you, I won't allow death to hold you, then he saw it as done. He trusted his father. So he's telling us now, imitate your father. Imitate your heavenly father. There's another scripture I want you to read. It's in the book of Galatians. Book of Galatians. And chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. This is so awesome if you meditate on this. We'll read verses 1 through 3. Galatians 4, 1 through 3. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. See, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Remember reading that in Romans? It says we're heirs of God. But it says the heir doesn't differ anything different from the servant or the slave as long as he is what? A child. You don't put a load of 45 in the hands of a child. All of this power in the hands of a child. And it goes on to say, but he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. This is the appointed time. We're in the appointed time. It says, even so we, when we were children, I underline that because see, that's in the past tense. This is coming to and speaking to someone who was a child. But now it's speaking to those who have grown up in the word of God, who are willing to accept the free gift of righteousness, who are willing to accept the fact that they have been made righteous, willing to accept the fact that Jesus did away with sins. They're no longer, <coughs> excuse me, they're no longer acting as children. Babies, they've grown up. They said, I'm gonna take my place. I'm going to take my turn at bat. I'm going to do the things that the Lord Jesus done because he said I would do these things. Let's read a little further. It says, verse 3, Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. Here, we were created to rule and reign over this whole world. But it says here that as long as we're children, we'll be in bondage to the elements of the world. What are the elements of the world? Time, Time wind, rain. You see what Jesus did with the elements of the world? He spoke to the water. He spoke to the wind. He didn't have to deal with time. If you go back and read that account, right after he spoke to the wind and to the, to, to the ocean, he, I don't know a better word for it, he teleported from where they were to where they wanted to be. What happened to time? What happened to gravity when he ascended? didn't stop being. Else <laughs> everyone would have flown off with him. <laughs> How do you gradually ascend? 
he overdid, he, he overcame the elements. <coughs> He's no longer under the elements of the world. What power, what it says the whole creation groans and travails waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. What if one child of God had been able to be uh, where that recent tornado was and been able to tell it to stop? You'll not come through here. Just one child of God. I'm believing that there, and, and I'm believing that you're a part of the generation of believers that will step up and say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start to speak to the elements. Well, just like my grandbaby, she couldn't wear my shoes, but she could sure start practicing. She could start imitating. Can't we at least do one little thing that scripture tells us to do? Be imitators of God as dear children. So, well, what if it doesn't work? That's not on us. That's the point of maturity that we're working on getting to. Jesus said, I say the words. My Father does the works. Can we just get brave enough to say the words? <clears throat> Is it in the... What is that, Job 22? Let's see if we can find it. Job. Let's see. This is the position of a king. In Job uh, chapter 22, verse 28, it says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy way. Amplified says, You shall also decry and decree a thing and it shall be established for you and the light of God's favor, that's his grace, shall shine upon you. That's what a king does. A king makes a decree. You are healed in the name of Jesus. Not you will be. You are healed in the name of Jesus. Well, what if they don't get healed? That's not on you. At this point, <clears throat> it's a point of maturity just being willing to say it and to get out of yourself as to where you're not looking at self oh I'm going to be embarrassed if it doesn't happen that is a statement of pride because what you're saying is I'm going to take the credit if it does happen that's why I don't want to do it and have it not happen because I'm going to receive the guilt. If you're going to receive the guilt, you're also lining yourself up. <coughs> Excuse me. You're lining yourself up to take the pride. You want the glory for it. And all the glory belongs to the Lord. And that's the difference in a child and a mature son of God. To God be the glory. We also saw that Jesus always gave the glory to the Father. Always. And it's such a blessing if you go through the scriptures and realize this relationship between God the Father and God the Son. God the Father is always saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And people would come to Jesus and say, oh Jesus, look what you did. And he says, oh, not me. It's my Father. They give the glory to each other. We as adult children should be willing to give the glory to God because he's given everything to us. It's all from him. It's not on us. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're talking about getting to the place where we're conscious of our righteousness and how it changes the way we think 
how it changes the way we speak, how it changes the way we act based on the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 3, well, turn over to chapter 1 first. We'll read in chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. It says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. It says, But of God. That's talking about him is referring to God the Father. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Don't look for the glory from this. To God be the glory. To our Lord Jesus be the glory. He's looking for us to show our obedience that we had demonstrated for us by our Lord Jesus who was obedient to the point of death. Isn't that what the scripture says? He became a, ser a servant, laid down his, his, his godly royalty and became a servant and was obedient even unto death. He wants our obedience. And our obedience would be to give him the glory because it says, let him the glory, glory in the Lord. Glory to God. Look what the Lord has done. You lay hands on someone and they're crippled and they get up and walk. Well, glory to God. Look what the Lord has done. Not what I've done. You say, well, what, when do we get our reward? You already have your reward. Jesus is our reward. We've inherited God. We have been given everything. Have been, not will be. So if you're still looking for your reward, you've missed it. We already have our reward. So now go to... Uh, chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is as plain as anything could ever be. It says, Therefore, verse 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. There's another one of those therefores. You should read up to that. Find out what it's there for. It says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. How many things are ours? All things. So what am, what am I looking for other than glory? It says the glory belongs to the Lord. And if I accept that, then, then what am I looking for to receive from God that I haven't already received. If all things are mine, I don't need God to give me anything. Why? Because, right, you have it. He's already given it to us. So we're doing things looking for a reward from God and wonder, I don't know why God doesn't bless me. He can't. He already has. He has blessed us. And we'll even read that scripture. It, we'll read, finish reading this. It says, Therefore let no man glory in, in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world. Or the what? Our life, our death, our things present, our things to come, all are yours. Now, what are we asking God for? What are we asking Him to give us? Give me wealth, it's all yours. Give me health, it's all yours. Give me peace, it's all yours. Should have peace that passes all understanding. With Jesus stripes you were healed. He became poor so that you could be rich. Come on, ask me to give you something hard. What is he going to give us? What does all leave out? Listen to this in the Amplified Bible. This is so awesome. 
says, verse 22, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas, Peter, or the universe. I love it when God is not shy about using words that are so awesome and, and, and are so awe-inspiring and, and cover so much that the mind has to stop and wait. Wait a minute. The universe? Would that mean the Andromeda galaxy? All. The whole universe. The whole of creation that we were designed to rule and reign over. How are we going to reign over the Andromeda galaxy? How, how are we to do that? To set in the seat as king of the world and decree a thing and have it established unto you. That'll never happen as long as our minds are still self-conscious rather than God-conscious. It's a maturing. So I'm no longer a child tossed to and fro by every changing wind of doctrine. I'm going to base my life on what God said in his word and I will grow in this until I'm no longer a slave to the elements. Isn't that what we read over there in Ephesians? That we were still under the elements. We we're still under the wind and the rain and the snow. It says, wait, you're, you're still dealing with things here, but I've got things across the universe that I want you to deal with. So I can't even think I figure out how to stop it from drizzling. Do you aspire to? That's the secret. Do you have a heart to grow up into the things of God and to teach others to do it? God sacrificed Jesus for us. What more can he do? How many more ways can he say this? That he wants us conscious of our righteousness. And he wants us to apply the fact that we've been made right with him he wants us to apply that to our everyday lives, to our thinking, to our speaking, to our actions, where we leave the trivial stuff. We know that God has taken care of it. We can do what Jesus said when he said, take no thought for tomorrow. He says, don't be like the heathens. The heathens need these things, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Say, so the heathens are the ones requested. The heathens didn't say atheists. The heathens meant the religious people. Those people acting religious. He doesn't want us acting in religion. He wants us to live in relationship. A relationship to him where he is truly our heavenly father. And because he is our father, we look to him to imitate him because he created us in his image and his likeness so that we could look like him and do like him and be like him. And there are some that would say that that's, a sac that that's sacrilegious to say you're going to be like God. He tells us to be like him. He created us to be like him in his image and in his, in his likeness. Let me read this again. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the universe, or life, or death. Does that sound like Jesus? Tabitha, arise. He spoke to the dead girl. She was dead. But he spoke life to her and she got up and lived. He had a funeral procession going past him and he got the son of this lady that was mourning up out of the casket. Imitate him. Oh, I should never do anything like that. That's the problem in the church. We're so self-conscious again. I wouldn't do anything like that. How embarrassing that would be. I, oh, not me. God wants us, this is a heart matter, he had wants us at least to have a heart to be like him. Have a heart of desire. Father, give me the boldness 
we wouldn't be the first ones in the church praying for that kind of boldness. And I'll show you that in the scriptures. Whether life, it says that the universe or life or death or the immediate and threatening present or the subsequent and uncertain future, all are yours and you are Christ, that's the 23rd verse, and Christ is God's. To God be the glory. Quit desiring the glory. He says in his word, if you will glorify me, I have glorified you. And I said it that way because there's no future tense with God. It's no future tense. We have just enough room to share one of the things I was going to share, and that's from Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll look at maybe three or four verses, verse 3 through, through 5. It says, Blessed be the God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Did he say he has done this? Is that past tense? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. With how many blessings? All. Oh. So what do we, no wait, he has done this. So now, if we're looking for him to bless us, what is he going to bless us with if he's already blessed us with all? A fellow wrote a book with a picture of a dog chasing his tail. And it was to represent exactly what we're talking about, us running around trying to ask God to give us what he's already given us. We're trying to work it out. We're asking him for things that already belong to us. He says, I can't give that to you. Why? You already have it. I've already given it to you. Let's read the next verse. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When did he choose us? So this has already taken place. Are we trying to court his favor now? Why would we be trying to court the favor of God now? <laughs> He's already, he chose us before we were even here. Before he said light be and light was, he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life to spend eternity with him. He wouldn't say light be until he knew that you were saved. Glory to God. We serve a good God. This is how much he loves us. He ha according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He set it up so that we would be right with him, without blame. That's the meaning of the word righteousness. To stand before him without any sin consciousness, without blame. We're blameless before God. No one can bring any blame on you before God. Why? Because in his mind, before he ever said, light be, Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blame that was due to me was put on him before God said, light be. This isn't an afterthought with God. God doesn't say, oh, I, they messed up. How am I going to do this? This was foremost in God's mind. This was his plan. He's not a loser. He worked it all out beforehand. That's why in our book that we're studying on applied righteousness in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus fulfilled all the will of God. God's entire, how do you feel, fulfill the whole will of God? Jesus did. He's our righteousness. The last scripture and then we'll take up in our next hour. Verse 5. 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will and Jesus fulfilled the entire will of God. We are his adopted children. People think that we're born again and meaning that we're born into his family. We're not. We're adopted into his family. We're born into a kingdom. We're not naturalized citizens. We were born in the kingdom of God. But we have been adopted into the household of God. It's a love adoption. We're not an accidental birth. We were adopted. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And we have to conclude this lesson. But we'll take this up some more. We're going to go right back to Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to start again in verse 1. And we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead us through how we can accept the fact that we have been made righteous. Well, until our next hour, this is Pastor Stewart signing off.